ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه وازواجه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار اما بعد او بريز از دو تو الله وي بريز ام ابندنتلي we ask allah's forgiveness and we seek allah's assistance and we seek refuge with allah from our evil souls and our bad deeds verily whomever allah guides to islam no one can lead astray and whomever allah allows to go astray because they do not want any guidance then no one can guide and i bear witness that there is no god worthy of our worship except allah alone with no partners and i bear witness that muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is his servant and his messenger May Allah exalt his mention, grant him peace his companions and everyone who follows them on their righteous path until the day of judgment. Allah says in the Quran interpretation of the meaning in English all you who believe have taqwa of Allah by doing what is commanded and staying away from what is prohibited the way Allah deserves it and do not die except as Muslims in a state of submission to Allah or mankind fear your lord who created you from a single soul Adam and from him created his partner eve and from them dispersed many men and women upon earth and fear allah to whom you demand your mutual rights and keep your kinship ties verily allah ever watches over you all you who believe have taqwa of allah and say a good deed he will help you establish and say a good word he will help you establish good deeds he will forgive you your sins and whoever obeys allah and his messenger has attained the greatest success as to what follows Verily the most truthful speech is the Quran the book of Allah and the best way of life and example to be followed is that of our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the worst of affairs are the ones that we introduce into this deen of ours because every newly introduced matter is an innovation and every innovation will lead astray and whatever is astray is going to the hell fire brothers and sisters in Islam assume that you wanted to go back home to get married for those of you who are not or other options i'm not going to elaborate on that right and you've been saving money you know you've been working hard you know you're trying to eat cheap food and so on and so forth because you want to save enough money so you can so you can go back home and get married uh because it's you know it's expensive nowadays and you do You save, you know, you work for years, hard work for many years until you accumulate enough money to go back home and get married. And on your way back on that flight, it just so happens that the layover was in some very lousy country. Okay, you had to stop somewhere before. It's not a direct flight, so so it's a layover. Uh, and you do stop, right? And that country happens to be so lousy. that they don't even have a hotel room for you okay they basically give you a waiting room and you're supposed to stay there for a few hours before you get back on the plane and continue your flight back home you got your money in your pocket you know the money you're going to get married with and everything uh and so that waiting room which you are sharing with others turns out to be very shabby you know very very ugly very boring very lame and so you say why don't i you know do something about this So you start, you know, making phone calls. Hey, you know, you call the carpet company, say come change this carpet, man. I don't like this carpet. Move it. 
Then you call the furniture company. Say, come bring some brand new sofas, some nice, you know, couches and so on and so forth. This, this lousy stuff we're sitting on doesn't work. You call the painter to come and do the paint job. Uh, you call, you know, the interior designer to come and design a place for you. And you invite everyone for a big fat dinner. You know, all those who happen to be waiting in the waiting room with you. And you spend all your money. And then you go back home with barely enough money to buy dinner for that night. Uh, what do you think, you know, your family, how would they react to this uh, foolishness, if we may call it? Do you think people will support you, say, MashaAllah, very intelligent move, you've, you've reconstructed and uh, you fixed up the waiting room in a lousy place that is not your place of residence, right? You will be criticized uh, drastically for such a lame move. But really, this is our life. This is the dunya. That shabby, ugly room that does not deserve much effort is our life, the life of the dunya, the worldly life. And it so happens that we Muslims, uh, unfortunately, the non-Muslims, this is a given, but the Muslims in this day and time have fallen to the same trap where we are putting much emphasis and focus and attention on our worldly life while disregarding the hereafter, which in this case is the marriage, the true success, the, the place where you're supposed to spend your money. So we're spending our money in the wrong place for the wrong reasons at the wrong time and it just doesn't happen to be working for many of us unless we make some changes uh, before we depart, meaning from this life. The dunya, ironically, linguistically, dunya comes from two different meanings. One Arabic word that has two different meanings. One is dunu, being near, right? And one is dana'a, being lowly. So the dunya is actually called dunya because it is near, it's, it's close to you because the hereafter is, is afterwards, right? After the day of judgment. So it's near. And everything seems to be around the corner. And it is dani'a or dana'a. It is lowly. As Allah had described it in numerous occasions in the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad sallam, as well in his uh, prophetic traditions and his narrations. And when we speak about the dunya and not being concerned about the dunya, we have to have some very uh, particular definition. Because some people have went to extreme in terms of supposedly being disinterested in the dunya and unconcerned. And so they wind up not really doing what the sunnah entails. And other people have went the opposite direction where they have focused on the dunya strictly and they don't have no time for the hereafter. And the objective of tonight's lecture inshallah is that we leave this place uh, by being on the middle course as it is our habit and custom always uh, as we are known as the Muslim Ummah, Ummatan Wasata, a middle nation a just community, we don't go to any extremes in any of the affairs of our deen or the dunya. We travel on a middle course and that is the way uh, to success. Uh, first and foremost, let me give you uh, what opposes the dunya. What do we call someone who is not concerned about the dunya? And the Arabic language is called the Zahid. And the act of being unconcerned about the dunya is called Zuhd. But I have some reservation concerning using the word Zuhd or asceticism as we know it in English because very often if you look up in a dictionary one of the synonyms of the word ascetic is Sufi. And I don't want to be propagating any of that stuff. So we will just use uh, or if I do use it by mistake, slip of a tongue, I'm not talking about these individuals. Okay, I'm talking about someone who's simply unconcerned about this particular worldly life of ours. We'll see to what extent. It doesn't mean that you know, you abandon everything. Anyways, let me give you the definition uh, that was given by Ibn al-Qayyim or before that. It says the zuhud is the opposite of being eager and concerned about the dunya. And the dunya we said is the life of this world. Uh, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, as zuhud in the Arabic language and the language of Islam entails abandoning a matter while despising it. Abandoning a matter while despising it, meaning not liking it, hating it, uh, while belittling its significance. It's unimportant to you. 
So that one will exchange it for what is more significant. So you leave something, you know, like if I offer you right now a real, and I tell you, but if you don't take the real now, I give you 20,000 riyals next week. Which one would you go for? Would you take the immediate one real or would you wait, you know, a couple of weeks and get 20,000 riyals? I mean, logically, you will wait. Even if I was fooling you, right? You didn't lose anything. A real, yeah, I mean, the real is not the end of the world. So, this is what is really meant. You leave alone something that is despised to you. It's not really important. It's not significant. Belittling that thing while seeking that which is more significant. In this case, it is the life to come. سُئِلَ الْجُنَيْدِ عَنِ الزُّهْدِ فَقَالْ إِسْتِزْغَارُ الدُّنْيَا وَمَحْوُ آثَارِهَا مِنَ الْقَلْبِ He was asked, what does Zuhd? Give us a, 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 a comprehensive definition. He said, it is belittling the dunya and erasing its effects from the heart. Belittling the dunya and erasing its effects from the heart. Abu Sulaiman al-Darani uh, said, الزُّهْدِ تَرْكُ مَا يُشْغِلُ عَنِ اللَّهِ Zuhd means abandoning anything that will preoccupy you, that will keep you busy concerning Allah. So you don't have time for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what does that mean? What does it mean? It means there's no time for worship. There's no time for Allah's rights. This is what is intended. And really, we will deal with this later on in the lecture, inshallah. To what extent some of us have this, uh, suffer from this particular illness, uh, which requires, you know, emergency treatment before it's too late. And of course, whenever you quote uh, the definition of something in Islam, then you cannot leave alone Shaykh al-Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi alayhi. He said, Az-zuhdu tarku ma la yanfa'u fil akhira, wal wara'u tarku ma taqafu dararahu fil akhira, wa istahsanahu ibn al-qayyim jiddan. Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullahi, I'm sure everybody or almost everyone knows him. He said, Zuhd entails abandoning what does not bring benefit in the hereafter. That which will not bring you any benefit on the hereafter. Wara, wara is basically leaving alone something permissible in order to avoid something impermissible. Yeah, and you leave something that is okay because you're afraid that that thing which is okay may lead you to something which is not okay. He said, wara is entails abandoning what you fear its consequences in the hereafter. Meaning you worry that you will be brought to account in the day of judgment, so you leave it alone. And this is understood from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the hadith of Nu'man anhu. He said, halal is bayin and haram is bayin, and between that are doubtful matters that many people do not know. So if you leave alone these doubtful matters, you have protected your dignity and your religious commitment. And so this is what is intended by that. Tayyip. The Zuhd in the Qur'an. I'm sure... As I'm sitting here, maybe some of you are bringing to mind right now some Quranic verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us the reality of the life of this world. And allow me to quote some of them to you in case you haven't. Allah says in Surah Al-Kahf, وَضْرِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا كَمَا إِنْ أَنزَلْنَاهُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فَاخْتَلَطَ بِهِ نَبَاتُ الْأَرْضِ فَأَصْبَحَ هَشِيمًا تَذْرُوهُ الرِّيَاحِ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ مُقْتَدِرًا and strike for them the similitude of this life of this world. It is like rain that we send down from the sky. And then the vegetation mingles with it. And then it becomes fresh and green. But then soon enough it becomes broken pieces and the wind scatters it away. The wind scatters it away. And verily Allah is able to do all things. So look at this example that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala struck. So he can tell you the reality of this life of this dunya. It is nothing but water that falls from the sky and mixes with the earth. As soon as the vegetation or the flowers look nice and pretty and you start to enjoy them, then soon enough they will become dry and the wind will scatter them away and then you have nothing left. And the dunya is gone. And the scholars have interpreted this ayah and other in a number of ways. One example is that whilst you're living, in your youth, you know, the prime of your life and so on and so forth, all of a sudden Allah decrees that some calamity befalls upon you in your own soul, where you are gone, you die. And then just as you started to enjoy the, the, you know, the beauty of life, then you have gone. Or you may remain alive, but some calamity will befall upon you where you lose your worth and your health and your children and your, and your, and your family and your job and so on and so forth, where you remain with nothing. 
Just when you thought you had a grip of everything, right? Just when you thought, Alhamdulillah, things are starting to move smooth, I'm graduating, I'm moving on, so let me focus more on the dunya, and set aside the rights of Allah, you know, until a future time. Right at that moment where you're not expecting it, death comes around, and then you will have no time to make up for anything. You'll be stuck with the dunya, and what you've accumulated in the dunya, with little preparation for the hereafter. And inshallah, I'm sure none of you are of that particular uh, caliber, because this is not befitting for a believer. Allah says, Ya ayyuhan nas, inna wa'da Allahi haqq, فَلَا تَغُرَّنَّكُمُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا وَلَا يَغُرَّنَّكُمْ بِاللَّهِ الْغَرُورِ O mankind, verily the promise of Allah is true. So do not let the present life deceive you. And do not let the chief deceiver, who's the chief deceiver? Satan. Satan. Do not let him deceive you concerning Allah. Do not let him deceive you concerning the dunya. So Allah warned us in the Quran, O mankind, this is speaking to the believers and the non-believers alike. The promise of Allah is true. What is the promise of Allah? That you will live here eternally? What is the promise of Allah? That there's a life to come? That there's Jannah and Jahannam? This is the promise of Allah. He promised the righteous believers to enter Jannah and those who are of another way of life to enter Jahannam al billah. This is the promise of Allah and it's true. So do not be deceived by the dunya. Allah is promised, subhanAllah, I don't and sometimes Ya yeah, akhwan and uh, brothers and sisters, we don't really reflect upon the Qur'an just as Allah told us in the Qur'an, that we don't reflect upon the Qur'an. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran? Should we not reflect upon the Qur'an? Look at it with care. Allah told us, and our Creator, who legislated this law of Islam for us, and who gave us our sustenance and provision, and who gave us everything that we need, He still told us every particular thing that you need to be successful. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through His mercy informed me and you. So you will not come on the Day of Judgment and say, I did not know any better. No one told me that I'm not supposed to be focusing on the world and I'm supposed to focus in the hereafter. No one told me that this life is deceiving. Allah told us clearly, the promise of Allah is true. So do not let the present life deceive you. How you get deceived? Either when you are ignorant or when you are negligent. If you are a boss at, a, at some business, the only way your employees may pull some stunts, you know, rob some money, do something that is not proper, either if you're ignorant, you don't know what's going on in the business, so everything is happening behind your back, or you're negligent. You're not paying attention. You're disregarding, you're, you're letting some things go that you're supposed to be more accurate about. So these are the ways that we are caught. And in the dunya, it's the same thing. Either you're ignorant about the fact that you're going to meet Allah, and that you'll be questioned about every single thing, your health, your body, what did you do with it? Were you, you know, smoking it up? Smoking, drinking, consuming unlawful things? Your life, your youth, what did you do with it? You know, you joined a rap group? Or you thought that you know, you're going to be a superstar? What did you do with your youth? Your money, how did you earn it? Where did you spend it? Did you get it from lawful means, through lawful means? And did you spend it in lawful means? If we were to be brought to account, each one of us here, Allah Musta'ad, right? You, each one is thinking about himself and I says, man, I'm, I'm, I'm through. I don't think I can make it, right? That's what we think because that's what we are. إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمَ اللَّهِ طبعا. We don't generalize. But by default, most of us, ya akhwan, we and, and sisters, we do have these particular shortcomings. Now, I'm not trying to despair you from the mercy of Allah because no one can do that. Rather, I'm trying to call myself and you to wake up. Wake up from the sleep. If you've been earning money unlawfully, hey, there are plenty of halal jobs. Change your job. Huh? If you've been spending money unlawfully, there's plenty of chances to change. Start using and spending your money in ways that are pleasing to Allah. If you've been focusing on the dunya versus focusing on the hereafter, then all these are within reach right now. Now that you're listening, now that you have the ability, the means given to you by Allah, then a change is expected before it is too late. And you know the verses from the Qur'an about death coming and we will deal with some of them right now. Allah says in the Qur'an, uh, in Surah Al-Imran, كُلُّ نَفْسٍ Everybody knows this ayah. ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ وَإِنَّمَا تُوَفَّوْنَ أُجُورَكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَازِ 
وما الحياة الدنيا إلا متاع الغرور every soul shall taste death and you will only be paid your wages in full look at these wording man عجيب عجيب بالقرآن you only be paid what your wages in full when do you usually get paid wages at work and they may you know the the boss may you know may trip may take some money unlawfully he may cut your contract before it is expired he may promise you accommodation and wind up not paying for it people may you know pull stunts you may not really get your wages in full and similarly in the dunya you may be the most righteous of the righteous but you will not be getting what Allah has prepared for you because Allah had decreed through his wisdom that you don't have a, this life because it may not be befitting for you so not like you do good deeds and you, you pocket get fatter you know the more righteous you are oh mashallah I'm getting richer so let me pray some more it doesn't have to be this way you may be more righteous and more poor and you may be more righteous and more rich as well and you may be more rich and more wicked and so there are all levels don't associate this with that because some people think if you're blessed meaning Allah loves you meaning if you're blessed financially not necessarily then if you're poor it doesn't mean that Allah does not love you either so it is situational it is per individual only Allah knows these matters of the unseen we cannot make any judgment concerning them anyways uh, you will only be paid your wages went in full on the day of resurrection on the day of judgment you will get what you have earned today not today not in this life there so what is the bottom line as Allah says فَمَنْ زُحْزِحَ عَنِ النَّارِ whosoever is removed away from the fire وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةِ and he was permitted to paradise فَقَدْ فَاسْ he has attained success nowadays foes is when the ahli beat the I don't know what the other team is and I don't want to know what the other team is or when this team beats the other team or the cricket teams or the I don't know what teams it's always foes when you get a new job when you make more money this is what we associate with success Success, I've become successful. Here's my master's, I am successful now. Here's my PhD, I'm successful now, and so on and so forth. That's what our mind associates success with worldly gain. But according to Allah Azza wa in the Quran, that when you enter Jannah, then and only then you have attained success. Not today. You could be the biggest doctor in the world, and you'll be dragged on your face to Jannah, billah, and no one will intercede for you. Not the patients, and not the nurses and no one in the world. If Allah decreed that you're among the inhabitants of the hellfire, case closed. And your worldly knowledge will not benefit you on the day of judgment. Not, not trying to tell you don't learn. We need in Islam people of every, every position and every uh, uh, you know, knowledge and so on and so forth. We need from everyone. So I'm not saying leave alone worldly knowledge, but as long as it doesn't become the priority. And we don't have time for the hereafter. Otherwise, alhamdulillah, working is good. So then, then Allah ended this ayah by saying, وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاعُ الْغُرُورِ And this life of this world is nothing but false deception. It's like Hollywood. You know Hollywood? Nothing is real. Dinosaurs, uh, you know, people are living on a spaceship, you know, people, I don't know what they come up with every day. But it's all fake. It's false deception. People get entertained and they sit there and watch and they just got a bunch of junk in their head. You know, you didn't get anything beneficial for your life or for the hereafter. Who cares about, you know, Star Wars or I don't know what these people do. Anyways, it's all false deception. It's unreal. It's far from reality. And the life of this dunya is as such as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described it in the Quran. So after Allah tells us that this life is false deception, do you get attached to it? Over attached? You cannot. We will see what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised his companions and we will see how they put it into practice and you will see why me and you are not from the companions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because we are somewhere else. Anyways, Allah says, اِعْلَمُوا أَنَّمَا الْحَيَاةُ, أنما الحياة الدُّنْيَا لَعِبٌ وَلَهْوٌ وَزِينَةٌ وَتَفَاخُرٌ بَيْنَكُمْ وَتَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ Look at this. No. Allah says, اِعْلَمُوا Ilamu is for jama' for plural. All of you know that the life of this world is nothing but play. Laib. Walahu. An amusement. Wa zina. And pomp and mutual boasting. Adornment. And rivalry between the people concerning their wealth and their children. My children are better than yours. 
I got more money than yours, my Lexus is newer than yours, and so on and so forth. You know, this, this is what the people, Allah told us this is what the people are about. This is the life of this dunya. Play, amusement, adornment, pomp and mutual, uh, boasting amongst each other, I am this and I am that, well I've graduated from here, you graduated from there, and so on and so forth, and just rivalry. People competing with one another concerning their wealth and their children. That's the, that's the dunya. Know that the life of the dunya is no more than this. Play, amusement, and so on and so forth. Meaning, you don't put all your eggs in that basket. You don't bet on this dunya because you will lose the bet. You will not remain. If the dunya remained for those who came after, you would not be here today. If the people that came before, especially the big shots, you know, the big, the Caesars, the, uh, and so on and so forth, if, if it remained for them after they owned the world at times, some of them owned the world, if it remained for them, you wouldn't be here today. But it didn't remain for them, so you inherited the dunya from our forefathers. And then our children will inherit the dunya from us. So you're leaving, sooner or later. And so prepare for the day of departure. Allah says in the Quran, "Man kana yurid al-ajilata, ajalna lahu fiha ma nasha liman nurid, thumma jalna lahu jahannam, yaslaha madhmuman madhura. Wa man arad al-akhirat wa sa'a laha sa'yha wa huwa mu'min, fa'ulaika kana sa'yhum mashkura." Allah says, "Whoever wants this quick passing, transitory life, then we will readily give them." Whatever we want, to whomever we will. But then what Allah will prepare in the hereafter, then we will prepare for him Jahannam, where he will enter therein, disgraced and humiliated. If somebody wants a quick passing life, is that all you want? Is that all you want? Do you want the dunya? Allah says he will give, he will readily give, whomever he wills, whatever he wants. He will give them a lot, but they will have nothing in the hereafter. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَةِ But for the one who wants the hereafter, وَسَعَى لَهَا سَعْيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ And he strives with the necessary do striving. Sa'i is stronger than عَمَل. He didn't say وَعَمِلَ لَهَا عَمَلَهَا أو مَا أَشْبَهَ ذَلِكْ Allah says Sa'i like when you do Sa'i between Safa and Marwa because it requires some effort especially when you run between the two green flags or the green lights. Sa'i in linguistically is stronger. And so Allah says Sa'a لَهَا He will strive. وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ You must be a believer. For the disbeliever, he will just be striving for the dunya. There will be no striving for the hereafter unless they have the belief first. Then verily it is those whom they are striving will be appreciated, thanked, and they will be rewarded accordingly. Whoever wants the akhirah. And when you want the akhirah, you may have the dunya. But if you want the dunya, you will not have the akhirah. Pay attention. If you want the akhirah, Allah may give you the dunya also. But... The dunya will be in your hand, not in your heart. That's how the scholars define it. For you just to know what is intended. Because some may have a misconception say, well you dress nice and you drive a nice car. Not, not me. Uh, but I'm just saying, like you may be thinking about someone. He has a nice car, nice home. So you say, this, this person is, no, no, he's no good. Huh? He doesn't have zod. He doesn't, he, he's concerned about the dunya. We say, not necessarily. The dunya is in his hand. But it may not be in his heart. And someone may have way less than that, but the dunya is in his heart. So the whole idea about zuhd then, is that the dunya does not overcome your heart. Where this becomes your main concern. Meaning, if you just so happen to lose it, life goes on. If for whatever reason you don't have what you had, you will not commit suicide. You will not despair from the mercy of Allah. You will not stop doing salah. Huh? They say, okay, Allah took away all my wealth, I don't want to pray anymore. If this is the case, that means the dunya has overtaken your heart. If it's in your hand, if it comes, it comes, alhamdulillah. If it goes, it goes. This was the way of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam and his companions, as we will see later on, inshaAllah. That's how they dealt with it. They had money. Uthman, radiallahu anhu, Abu Bakr, Abdurrahman ibn Awf. These brothers were millionaires, but the dunya was in their hand. They were never concerned about it. They didn't care about it. They remained subservient to Allah. In the state of submission to Allah. In the state of fear, love and awe to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Although they had money. And that money they used it for the purpose of Islam. 
and propagating Islam and serving the Muslims. And so if you follow the, these footsteps with the kind of money that Allah gave you, then verily you're upon a right, righteous path. بَلْ تُؤْثِرُونَ وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى Nay, but you prefer the life of this world. And the hereafter is better and more lasting. Way more lasting. Actually, you cannot even compare. What, what is 60 years, 70 years if you live 70 years? If you live 8 years, ya ammi. Let's say you get that old. What is that compared to eternity? Mathematically, I don't know if it makes any, if there's any ratio, 0 0.00001. Eternity. You know what eternity means? Meaning it doesn't end. There's no end for the pleasure and the bliss and the happiness that Allah prepared for the believers in Jannah. There's absolutely no end for that. Rather, there's increase. You begin at some level and things continue to get better. As a hadith of Prophet on Friday, that the believers will go to a souk, a market called the market of, of Jumu'ah in Jannah. And they will go and they will look better than when before they had left. And they will come back to find their, their family also in the same condition. People actually get better. Nobody goes down. So Allah says, وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ It is better. وَأَبْقَى And it is more lasting. Forever that is. So if you have any intellect, if you think you're intelligent, if you graduated from school, and you were able to pass, then that intelligence should lead you. Even if you didn't graduate from school, don't say, okay, so I didn't graduate from school, I'm not included. Inshallah, you've never been to school. If you have a brain that allows you to make a distinction between white and black, and I don't mean races, I mean colors, like a fabric, then you should be able to make a distinction between whether you should choose the dunya or the hereafter. No excuse, yani. If you don't, then you're insane. If you're insane, you're not held accountable in Islam, so ma fi mushkila. Okay, if you don't, if you cannot make a difference, then you're not considered to be Islamically accountable. Because, you know, the majaneen are not part of the people who are uh, mukallafeen. And so if you know enough, Akhi, to make a distinction between the simplest of things, then you should be able to make a distinction between that short life of this world versus the life to come. And inshallah, after you know, do you act accordingly or do you go to sleep? I mean, let's say you were able to make a distinction. Okay, the, the hereafter is better. Then what do you do? Should you work? Some of you, you don't want to work? Answer. Yes. You're afraid, huh? Don't be afraid. Say, I'm going to work and do tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and iyaqan abudu wa iyaqan asta'in and you will do the work. Don't be, maybe some of us are afraid, say, I don't want to say I work because maybe I don't want to work. No, inshallah, you do want to work. Okay, you just, you know, keep the shaitan off the business and seek refuge with Allah from him so he won't whisper to you nonsense and depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you'll be fine. وَمَا أُتِيتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَمَتَاعُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَزِينَتُهَا فَمَتَاعُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَزِينَتُهَا وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ وَأَبْقَى أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ It's very similar to the previous one. And whatever you have been given is simply the pleasure of this life and it's adornment. And whatever is with Allah, which is Jannah, is again better and more lasting. Do you have no sense? Allah says, أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Do you not understand? Do you have no sense? And if you have sense and you do understand, then you will act accordingly. Because the problem that we suffer from predominantly is that we know, but we don't do. Really, if you evaluate the status, if you evaluate yourself and those around you and the Muslims in general, you will find that the main problem that we have today is that many of us know, but don't act according to the knowledge. And that is a calamity. That is a calamity in this life and in the hereafter. Because if you were to do this in the dunya, people may kill you. If you are a firefighter, okay, and you have all the means and the skills to fight a fire in the case that it does uh, happen, and you're standing right next to the fire, fire truck, okay, and you have the water hose in your hand, and there's a building on fire, a house, and people are dying, and you're standing there watching, okay? Now when the people come afterwards, they're going to speak to you, say, hey, you know, you probably didn't know how to use this, right? You probably didn't know how to use the water. I said, no, no, I am. I'm a firefighter. So what do you mean you're a firefighter? And he was saying, well, is your arm broken? No, no, my arm is fine. Yeah, why didn't you, why didn't you go ahead and put out the fire? I said, well, you know, 
I know how to use everything, but you know, I just, you know, I didn't think, you know, it was a very wise decision. What do you think the people are going to do to you? Especially if they're the family of the victims. Chances are they will throw you in the fire. Before the fire is out. And before the other firefighters who do the job come and do it. Why? Because you have knowledge. And you're not doing anything about it. See, this is crazy. And so when you know something about Islam, you cannot afford not to act accordingly. Now yes, we will have shortcomings, we will sin. We, I'm not saying you're going to become perfect people. We will still have our problems. But I'm talking about things that are feasible. Things that you can do. And so when you have knowledge, ya akhi, act accordingly. Tayyib, uh, this is the ayat. What about the narrations of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He said to Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu wa ardahu an abih, Kun fi dunya ka'annaka gharibun aw aabiru sabil. Be in, he grabbed Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu by his shoulder, you know, in a very affectionate way, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He told him, be in this dunya as if you are a stranger or a wayfarer, yani a traveler, someone who doesn't have any permanent residence, is always just moving around. Now, of course, I think we've dealt with this before, but just for those who are coming for the first time, just allow me to elaborate just a little bit on this idea that Prophet was trying to send across to the Ummah. Be in this dunya like a stranger. Uh, who's Saudi here? Raise your hand. I'm not. Don't be fooled by this. Ha! Huh. Hey, no Saudi is here. Bye. <laughs> Maybe you're thinking something else. Tai. Listen, if you're not Saudi, when you first came here, and until today, I don't care if you've been living here for 30 years, you are a stranger. And when do you feel that you're going back home? When do you go back home? You may live here most of your life. Maybe you've been living here for 20 years, and you're 25 years, or you're 30 years old. You only lived in your country 10 years. No matter how long you remain here, you will ever be a stranger. We, we will ever be strangers. Even if you talk like them, you dress like them, and you eat kapsa. It's not going to change anything. Because this is not your culture. You see what I'm saying? When do you feel home? When you go back home. When everybody looks like you, dresses like you, speaks like you, eats like you, everything is like you. Of course, with some variation, it's not like everybody's is identical. But to some extent, these are your people. Now, no matter how many years you've been here, you are a straight, you don't fit, you fit. To some extent, no matter how hard you manage, at the end of the day, you're not from the locals. And anyone who goes to your country is going to be the same thing. You can never really totally fit in, you will ever remain a stranger. So then the quality of the stranger is that he doesn't belong. That's what I'm trying to send across. As a stranger, you don't belong. And the Prophet ﷺ told Ibn Umar, be in this dunya like a stranger, meaning don't belong. Don't feel that you belong here because you don't belong here. Where's home? In Jannah. Home is in the hereafter. So no matter how much you try to manage huh, to get along with the people by, by you know, doing your best to work, go with the flow as they say, you will never really be home until you go back home. And in the dunya, it's the same thing. This is the first. Second, a traveler. When you travel, do you pack your, your whole house? Have you ever seen anyone carry his air conditions, you know, the split AC on his shoulders, and he has a fridge on the back, you know, and the, the stove, you know, and so on. The couch is, where are you going? Well, I'm going to two months vacation back home. Are you taking all of your furniture with you? A traveler? Doesn't, you know, you say travel light, huh? You don't take more than what you need, your passport, you need some money, you need some clothes, and some gifts for the Pino you know, family back home. Khalas! Nobody takes all of his furniture, Allah says, Allah, I'm going, every time you want to travel, you bring everything in, you bring your whole house, take it with you and bring it back. People say, you're foolish. So when you're a traveler, you don't burden yourself with too many things that will make your travel difficult. And you know, some people hate to even have a luggage. Even a small one, you wish you could just travel like this. You know, you have nothing to carry. You don't have to wait, you know, for the baggage claim. We love to travel, you know, light. Uh, and the dunya, the Prophet ﷺ told Ibn Umar, also, travel light. Don't, don't burden yourself with too many, thing, too many things. that will become an obstacle for you when you try to make it to the hereafter. So you will not be able to travel successfully. Your car may break down and you may never make it because of overload of furniture. And so I hope that is clear. 
Of course, I'm giving you a very modern example of this uh, hadith, but I'm just trying to give it to him in such a way where we can relate to it, because that's what we relate to. Of course, our righteous predecessors had something more eloquent than what you heard from me. Either way, be in this dunya like a stranger or a traveler. Yani don't belong and don't travel with too many things. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith of Zayi Muslim, Ad-dunya sijnu al-mu'min wa jannatu al-kafir. I'm sure most of you know this hadith as well. The dunya is a prison for the believer. It's a prison. What does that mean? Does it mean that you're behind bars? That you can't go out? No. No. It means there are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made the human soul, human, the humans have the tendency to want to acquire. You love some things that are not good for you. And Allah made them prohibited. So you're almost like imprisoned from following your desires. It is a prison for your desires. Because your, di your desires may be the greatest uh, enemy to you. And he said, similarly, the dunya is a jannah for the kafir. It's a paradise for the disbeliever because he has no borders, no limitations. Whatever the disbeliever wants to do, he does. The only time he will stop is when he's ashamed of the people around him. Never because he's ashamed of Allah. He doesn't care. He doesn't care what God you know, thinks. What he cares about is following his desires. He may not do something because people are watching. And in, uh, back in, in uh, some years back in New York, uh, when the electricity went out, okay, there was some outage in the electricity for a few days, Every store was robbed. People were pulling up in Mercedes. Okay, he's driving a Mercedes. He pull up by the store, he run and get a microwave and run out of the store. Hey, you got money, man. So, but now, see, the, he wasn't doing this robbery before because he has a, a status with the people. Now that the electricity is out, no one can see him. Yalla. Yalla, let me also pick up a microwave. Why not? And I'll sell it in the garage sale next week. So the people then, had he feel, a Muslim, would he do that? Would you rob the place when there's no electricity and then when there's, you know, would you not fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You would do, out of, out of the fear of Allah, you would not rob the place whether there's electricity or there's no electricity. That's the quality of the believer, not the quality of the disbeliever. Anyways, an interesting uh, athar or, or incident that happened with this hadith is that of Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, rahimahullah ta'ala, you know, the one who did Sharh uh, Sahih Bukhari. Uh, he was a qadi, he was a very famous judge. And he was uh, traveling in a town with his fancy, you know, horses and so on. And his, you know, nice uh, uh, carriage that is carrying him. Uh, and, you know, wearing his nice uh, thobe and he's looking, you know, just mia mia. Immaculate as they say. Uh, he went by a Jew who was in the business of selling oil. Okay, and his clothes are all oily. He just looked, he just looked, you know, very bad. So he told Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah, he said, your messenger said, that the dunya is a prison for the believer and it's a jannah for the disbeliever. But look at you and look at me. It looks like you're the one who's in jannah and I'm the one who's in, you know, in prison. So he's trying to be funny or smart. And Abu Hajar refuted him, rahimahullah, by saying, he says, actually, what I am in right now compared to what Allah has prepared for the believers in the hereafter is like a prison. And what you are in right now, compared to what Allah has prepared for the disbeliever from punishment, is like Jannah. And so the man had no choice but to say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anu Muhammad Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is refutation, man. Charcoaling, burning refutation. What are you going to say? That's fact. And the, Jew know, the, Jews, the Jews know, they know this man. They know that, that they're deliberate disbelievers. Rejecting Jesus, peace be upon him, as the messenger of Allah, then afterwards rejecting Muhammad as the messenger of Allah. So they love to reject. So they know, they know these things. So anyways, that was the answer that Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah, gave him. Uh, maybe you could use it in the future. The Prophet said about the dunya, ما الدنيا في الآخرة إلا مثل ما يجعل أحدكم أصبعه في اليم ثم فلينظر بما يرجع. The Prophet said, the life of this world is nothing. But like when one of you places his finger in the ocean, huh? just you dip your finger in the ocean, and then you look, what, what, the, what sticks on your finger? What comes back? If you put your finger in the ocean, what would you take out? A gallon of water? A drop. Maybe two drops. Maybe half a drop. Prophet said this dunya, compared to the hereafter, is like somebody dipping his finger and getting a drop. 
Yani this dunya and everything in it is like a drop compared to the hereafter. And you know, that's why concerning da'wah, he told Ali radiallahu anhu, for Allah to guide one person to Islam through you is better for you than the red camels. Another narration better for you than the world and whatever is upon it. Everything in this dunya. For one person to become a Muslim through you is better than all of that. Meaning the dunya is insignificant in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet ﷺ had once uh, slept on a straw mat, which left some marks on his back. When he got up, Ibn Mas'ud, his companion who said, Oh Messenger of Allah, would you not allow us to get you some, some soft bedding rather than this one? The Prophet ﷺ told him, Mali walid dunya, innama mathali wa mathali dunya, innama mathali wa mathali dunya, ka mathali raqib, qal aynama fi dhilli shajara, fi yawmin sa'if, thumma raha wa tarakaha. He said, let, me put, let, let us get you some soft bedding, O Messenger of Allah. He said, what, what have I to do with this world? What have I to do with this world? Verily, my example and the example of this life of this world is like a rider. Rider meaning a horse or a camel or something along these lines. Who slept, took a short nap, qala, short nap, under a tree seeking its shade for a short time. Then he got up and he left it away. That's it. My example with this dunya is like somebody riding long distance, you stop by a tree for a short pause just to relax, get some shade, and then you move on and you leave. That's the dunya. It's a very short visitation, like visiting a, a, an ill person or a sick relative in the hospital. Do they let you stay with them for too long? No. As soon as you come in, they say, okay, visitation time is over, you need to leave. This is the dunya. You will come for some short time, and then soon enough, some men will be carrying you on their shoulders. And the maqbara is very close here. Maqbara al faisaliyah I believe, or it's maybe called something else. I don't know what it's called. Very close. And you've seen people before, carried on the shoulders, in the grave by yourself. You will not take your clothes. You will not take your cell phone. If you spend much time on that, you will not take your money. No pockets in the, in the uh, what you call it, the shroud, the kafan, zakallahu khairan. Nothing. Nothing. You will go with absolutely nothing and then your children or your relative will inherit everything that you've been striving for. You worked hard and you, you spend time making money, no time for knowledge, no time for learning, no time for worshipping, no time for obeying Allah, and you accumulated all the money and the degrees and so on and so forth, and then you went to the grave with nothing. Wallah, this is a losing business. Somebody who loses this kind of loss, this is a major loss that cannot be rectified. Now you lose, you can start another business. On the day of judgment, if you lose, it's over. Unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showers us with His mercy. These are some of the narrations. And then you may be wondering, what is the wing of a mosquito? Who knows what the wing of a mosquito is? Raise your hand. Two brothers? Three brothers. It must have been ambiguous for you. Say, what is this brother going to bring a dissected mosquito over here? Maybe you thought it was a science class, huh? Now we're going to talk about, you know, namus or, uh, or how to get bit or how to protect yourself from, from the uh, mosquitoes. No. No, this hadith, this, this expression is based, based on a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which was narrated by Tirmidhi. Now, and it was sahih by Shaykh al-Albani rahimahullah ta'ala. He said, لَوْ كَانَتِ الدُّنْيَا تَزِنُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ جَنَاحَ بَعُوضَةٍ مَا سَقَى كَافِرًا مِنْهَا شَرْبَةَ مَا He said alayhi salatu wasalam, had this world, this worldly life, been equal or worth the wing of a mosquito in the sight of Allah, he would not have given the disbeliever a drink of water, a sip of water. Had this dunya been equal in the sight of Allah to the wing of a mosquito, you know how insignificant that is? That's nothing, the wing of a mosquito. It's one of the smallest insects. And its wing is even smaller, you can hardly ever see it. All you hear is, all you feel is the bite that it gives you after it leaves. If it was worth that, Allah would have not given the disbeliever a drink of water. Now the disbeliever, does he have water? Many has a lot more than that. Allah gives the disbeliever water, food, family, wealth, health, you name it. Allah may give him a lot more than that. That shows you how insignificant this life is to Allah. This is what the hadith is talking about. Because the disbeliever doesn't deserve. Let me tell it to you straight. 
Because some people have misconceptions about Islamic perspective concerning the disbelievers and what is our attitude regarding them. Let us be real with ourselves because this is a matter of the deen. We'll try to put it in the nicest way possible, but we have to be real. A disbeliever does not deserve a drink of water, not even a bottle. Why? Because he is ungrateful to Allah. He is ungrateful to the one who created him, proportioned him, and sustained him. From the moment he was perceived in his mother's womb, he was receiving sustenance and he did not have to work. And Allah ensured that he grows in a very safe area in his mother's womb. Imagine how technical that is. Then he is to be delivered in a fashion similar to that. Then he is maintained through his mother with absolutely no effort on his behalf. And someone continues to take care of him until he reaches the age of puberty where he should at least pay attention to the one who bestowed all these favors upon him. And that individual is so ungrateful to Allah that he does not give Allah what Allah deserves. And he not only that, rather he disbelieves in Allah, rather he calls on to other gods with Allah and he propagates false worship by calling people to a false religion which Allah did not send down any authority concerning. That's the quality of the disbeliever. And if Allah was to treat him justly, then he wouldn't get a sip of water. And I'll give you the most easiest example. You run a business, you're a, you're a CEO of some business, and you hire an employee, and we've used this before, you give him everything that he has. Every single thing that he has. And then, he does not give you anything in return. Nothing. He does not even put one minute of work for your business. Rather, he goes and he puts all the effort for another business. And everything he's taken is from you. And everything he's given back is to some other stranger. What would you do with him? You wouldn't even give him a halala. After you have given him all this, huh? after you given all this, you wouldn't even give him a halala. Rather, what would you be asking for? Say, give me back my money. Right? Give me. And this is Jahannam. This is Jahannam. Not only that Allah wouldn't have given him a sip of water in this dunya, rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will place him in the hellfire. Jaza'an wifaqa. It's an equal recompense. Innahum kanu la yarjuna hisaba. They used to never be waiting or holding or bringing to mind the accountability with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the state of the disbeliever. And this is why he is treated in this fashion, because he is ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But because this dunya is so insignificant to Allah, the disbeliever gets water and a lot more than that. So we should understand from that what is expected of us to do. The Prophet said, Izhad fi dunya yuhibbuk Allah. Yuhibbuk Allah. Wazhad fi ma aydi nas yuhibbuk al nas. Or kama kala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Be unconcerned regarding this life of this world, and Allah will love you. Meaning, don't let the dunya enter your heart. Then Allah will love you. And be disinterested with what is in the people's hand and what they possess, and the people will love you. Yani, leave the people's stuff alone. People don't like it when you try to take what they have. So this nasiha from the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, and we want to focus on the first part of it, be disinterested, unconcerned with this life of this world, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love you. So if you want to attain the love of Allah, don't be over attached to the dunya. Then I will give you some examples inshallah at the end of the lecture to bring some clarity concerning that. I will uh, bypass some things inshallah for the uh, reason. But I want to share this hadith with you, which is very similar to the one of the mis uh, Mosquito. It's a Sahih Bukhari, a Muslim. Uh, the hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu, he said that he was with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they were in a, in a marketplace. And then there was a dead a goat, a dead goat with very small ears. And this is considered to be a deficiency in a goat. A goat with small ears is considered to be deficient. People have no interest in that. It's like, it's a, it's a fault, right? Uh, in that animal and people usually would not purchase that. The Prophet ﷺ, when he seen a dead goat with small ears, he grabbed it by the ear. And he told his companions, would one of you like to buy this for a dirham, which is a currency? kind of money, real, dollar, whatever you use. They said, oh messenger of Allah, had it been alive, had it been alive, we would not even want it because it has small ears. Then what about the fact that it is dead also? He said, really, the dunya is less significant in the sight of Allah than this God is to you. 
Ajeeb. Ajeeb. And we seem to be holding on to the dunya like this. Don't let go. If brother's begging you to let go. Say, I don't want to let go. I love it too much. But you're going to leave sooner or later. Now, how does it leave? You know how it leaves? All of a sudden there'll be nothing. You'll be embracing the dunya and you'll find gap. A big gap between your chest and your arms. Or someone will pull you from your back and throw you out. And suddenly the dunya that you were very attached to, you will become disattached from the dunya. That's how it's going to go. Either you're going to suddenly die or you're going to know that you're dying by some sort of disease that may befall you. And you know it's a gradual process before you leave. One of these two ways. Either way, you are leaving the dunya. And so the Prophet ﷺ was trying to teach his companions, don't be over concerned with the dunya. So you will not be a loser on the day of judgment. Tayyip. Let us define what zuhd really means. It does not mean that you don't work. And it does not mean that you do not get married. And it does not mean that you do not enjoy what Allah has made, made lawful for you. Because you can only understand the Quran and the Sunnah according to the way of life of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. How many wives did he have? When he died he had according to the ulama, nine. Someone who the Sufis will consider to be Zaid wouldn't have even one. Because he's not concerned with the dunya, so why would he need women? The Prophet ﷺ and his companions, they used to benefit from whatever was lawful, but they would not strive for it. If it happened to come, they enjoyed it. If it was not there, then they did not feel despair. They did not go after it. Because we know from the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ that many months will go by and no fire will be kindled in his house, meaning no food was cooked. And he used to live with his wife Aisha over dates and water. Al-Aswadan. Dates and water only for months. This is how they lived. But when things came, alhamdulillah, they enjoyed them. So we said that the reality of Zod is that not that you abandon the dunya where you become a loser and you just beg people for money. Akhi ma'alish, I spend most of my time in the masjid. Can you help me? You know, can you give me some money? Say no. No, akhi, go work. Go earn a living. Go, uh, you know, uh, protect yourself and honor yourself and make lawful money. But don't let the dunya overtake your heart. Continue to have a defense system, an alarm system, where whenever the dunya is approaching, you know, the laser will go off and ala tool you will make the necessary, you know, uh, actions or reactions. And you do what is necessary. Don't let the dunya enter your That is what Zuhud really means. Uh, you know, from Sulaiman and Dawood, again, they had, they owned the dunya, they were kings. And they were the biggest of Zuhad during that time, alayhim uh, salatu salam Tayyip, is Zuhad important or not? It is important for each one of us to practice Zuhad. But what level of Zuhad? Let me tell you how the scholars have defined them. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimallah said, Zuhad is different parts and levels. الأول زهد في الحرام وهو فرض عين being unconcerned with the unlawful the prohibited and it is فرض عين it is compulsory on each individual that you do not commit that which is forbidden second زهد في الشبهات leaving alone the doubtful things and the stronger the doubt the more you should be disinterested and you should disassociate yourself from the doubtful matters thirdly being disinterested with unnecessary things whether it is speaking or eating or drinking, things that you really do not need. Stay within the limitations. Fourthly, being disinterested with the people. You don't care about the human beings or what they have. Your main objective is Allah and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fifthly, not caring about yourself and you consider yourself to be insignificant in the sight of Allah. Where you do whatever you can. You strive with your wealth and your health and your body to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for every position there's a particular impl implication for this uh, understanding. And lastly, which is the comprehensiveness of Zuhd, is being unconcerned from anything that will distract you from Allah. Anything that will distract you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which we should love. I don't know if we really love Allah as we are supposed to love Allah. But we are supposed to love Allah. It is not a relationship of fear that the believer has. It is a relationship of fear, love and hope. You must have all three. Love, ya akhwan, must be part of the equation. It must be part of the formula for success. 
There must be love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means that you must give that some time. Whether it is learning or reading or educating yourself or giving da'wah or anything that will get you closer to Allah. This is what is intended by that. And this is the uh, bottom line statement. Lastly, let me mention quickly and briefly some things that will help me and you huh, become among those who are unconcerned about the dunya and more focus about the hereafter. First, look at this dunya, how quickly it passes. How many of your relatives were alive one day and dead the next? How many people you've, you've attended their funeral and their janazah and you've placed them yourself in the ground? Remember that your turn is coming. Don't forget about that. Remember the hereafter and how virtuous and bountiful it is and what Allah has prepared for the believers from pleasure and happiness and bliss. So when you remember that and you compare it to the dunya, then as we said, if you know the difference between black and white, then you'll be able to make the right decisions and favor the akhirah over the dunya. Remember the hereafter and look in the biographies of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and his companions. Read how they used to live. Read the biography of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, al Khalifa al Rashid, the fifth Khalifa of the Muslims in terms of righteousness. Look, if you read this, this man's biography, you will not believe that people like this even exist. Had we not known from, from authentic narrations that this is real, you will think this is, this is unreal, it's fictional. But they used to be, they owned the dunya. They owned so much money, but it, was, it never overcame their heart. It never possessed their heart. They were always attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you read them, you find a means of encouragement. You feel that you need to follow the footsteps of these righteous people, which is feasible bi Azza wa Jal. Each one of us is able to do that himself. Leave alone the gatherings of the people of the dunya. In uh, Ami is called Girgir Katir. That's what we learned. <laughs> leave, that, leave that alone. You know, that stuff doesn't really benefit you. You waste much time going back and forth talking about things that will benefit you with nothing. And this is what is known as al lagu Idle talk. And Allah prays the Ibadur Rahman that they turn away from al lagu This is the Surah Al-Mu'minun. وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا if, if they happen to be in a place where people are talking idle talk, talk that does not benefit, they go with honor. Yani they don't associate themselves with that. So only speak with that which is necessary. The Prophet ﷺ used to be silent often. And he only spoke when he had something beneficial to say. Nowadays we are the other way around. We almost never stop speaking. And the only time when we are not sinful is when we're silent. Because when we open our mouth, we wind up saying things that we're not supposed to say. So we've turned the tables around. Maybe we should turn them around once again. Perhaps we could follow the way of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Musta'an. All of us are guilty of that. Not all of us are talking too much. Leave alone excessive food, drink, and laughter. Uh, there's limitation in everything in Islam. You may enjoy yourself in eating and drinking from what Allah has made lawful. But if you eat and drink too much, then you're going to sleep too much. And if you sleep too much, you will always be lazy in the salah. You will hardly ever pray a prayer without yawning around 15 to 20 times in the salah. And believe me, a salah of this nature is not the salah of the khashi'een. It's not the one that Allah says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ If you are yawning from the time you enter the salah until you leave, then brother, we are already disqualified. Let me tell it to you real, in reality. We are far away. If you're always making it to the salah at the last minute, if you're never in the first row, always in the second jama'ah, third row, fourth row, fifth row, we are far away. Because eating and drinking will lead you to that. You get tired, always tired. And so when you eat and drink less, you see the athletes, you know, the athletes are on a very strict diet. You know, uh, they're on a seafood diet. And some brother told me, you know what seafood diet means? He said, seafood diet meaning I see food, so I eat food. <laughs> I told him, man, this is, this is an unacceptable joke. You know, I thought it was seafood, you know, he's eating fish or something. It turned out seafood diet meaning he sees food, he eats food. So don't be on the seafood diet, because that is not a good diet. Rather, follow the way of Prophet The worst container the son of Adam fills is his stomach. If you really have to eat, one third for food, one third for drink, and one third for air, you should be able to breathe. If you're not able to breathe, meaning you did not eat one third. And very often when we're done eating, we cannot even walk, let alone breathe. So uh, that tells you that, you know, that will affect your level of zuhud. 
and concern about the dunya. Yes, this was the last one. And so in finality, I conclude this lecture by reminding myself and you that whenever we hear these reminders, we do not want to fall summan wa amyana, deaf and blind. We don't want to hear, enjoy, get entertained, say mashallah, ABC, and then go home like nothing happened. If this is the case, we're all failures. We're failing this lecture business that we're doing, and I mean business with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking Allah to accept our deeds. For you coming here, you're rewarded inshallah. If you need us, correct. And the speaker as well, if my need is correct. But we don't want to lose this business by just not doing what is expected. So now that you have heard, brothers and sisters in Islam, strive to implement. You may not become, you may not change, you know, 180 degrees as they say, overnight. Where you wake up the next day, wallah, you don't care about the dunya, and khalas, all day you're worshipping Allah. It's not going to happen. If you are expecting that, then the shaitan is fooling you already. Be realistic. Set some reasonable, attainable goals. But strive. From now on, when I hear that there's room for me to learn, or to obey Allah, or to join something good, and it is in conflict with some worldly gain, I favor the hereafter over the worldly gain. Unless you are in dire need of money, and if you leave alone work, you will be in need. But some of us, the akhwan, mashallah, tabarakallah, their pockets are full. And still, if ever given the opportunity to choose between a, a deed of the hereafter and a deed of the dunya, they will go for the dunya and more money. And they will hardly ever choose to go for the deed that will help them in the hereafter. Even if it was helping the people financially. If he cannot join, pay some money. Let the event go, you know, go along. So then, uh, that we need to do. Give some time for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is, yani, aib. The, the Salaf, the righteous predecessor used to say, back, he's saying this like 300 years after the Sahaba, he said that the people, the time of Sahaba, used to give all the time that they had for Allah. And whatever is left, they will give for the dunya. And then he said that some, you know, some 1200 years back, he says now, he's saying that now, this is Abdullah ibn Aoun. Then he said, he said now, people give all their life for the dunya. And whatever is left, they give it for the hereafter. And what do we say about today? Allah Musta'an, what do we say about today? We may even give nothing for the after. The whole life is for the dunya, for the dunya, for the dunya which we are going to leave behind. So I ask you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be mindful of these facts, these ayat, which I'm sure you've read or heard before. These narrations that Prophet tried to teach me and you, he knew that this would be conveyed to us alayhi salatu salam. That's why he gave these narrations by the will and decree of Allah. Allah knew that we will receive this information today. And so Allah will see how we will act. Those who will listen and obey, Alhamdulillah, they have been rightly guided. Those who turn away, then of course they will be dealing with that, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. But I wish everyone the ultimate success, including myself. وَأَخْرُ دَعْوَانَ الْحَمْدِ اللَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ وَسَلَّمَ وَبَارَكَ عَلَى نَبِيَنَ مُحَمَّدٍ If you have any questions concerning this topic or otherwise, feel free to ask. Related to your subject today, uh, there's always a say that we hear or say to each other, "Amal dunyak kannaka taishu abdan wa wa amal akhirta kannaka tamutu qadan." Nam. I heard different explanation for this sentence. It's actually there was opposite each other. Mm. So can, can you explain it to us and relate it to your subject that you talked to us today? Now, from, from what I've heard, I've heard this statement before, and it is attributed to some of our righteous predecessors, and what is intended is that you, you strive for each accordingly. We mention, and Allah says, وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Don't forget your portion of the dunya. You, Allah has made some things halal, tayyibat, for the believers to enjoy. So you work for the dunya, where you don't procrastinate and you strive to become independent from the people. But you work for the hereafter in the same fashion, as if you're going to die tomorrow. Meaning, you are always ready, you're always in a state of repentance, always in a state of repentance, you're in a state of ta'ah. So whenever your hereafter comes, then you will die 
in a khatimatul khatim al husna right a so you will have a good end allahu alam barakallahu